Life sciences research is leading us into a whole new era. We're entering the age of man-made people. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. You know, major scientific advances often force us to re-examine what we value, what is worth pursuing, and what should be left in the petri dish or the lab. Genetics is the same, but the stakes could be much higher since we're playing with the code that determines who we are. As we learn more about how our genes operate, we face the challenge of using that information in ethical ways. Your ethics may not be the same as mine. How can free and free market nations sort out the ethical questions of genetic biotechnology? Let's look at a couple of areas of concern. When Louise Brown was born in England in 1978, she caused an international uproar. Brown, you see, was the first baby born as a result of in vitro fertilization. About in vitro fertilization, the term refers to a process whereby an egg is removed from a woman and fertilized by sperm in a petri dish. After the egg divides several times, it is implanted in a woman's uterus and the infant is born either through the birth canal or by cesarean section. That first in vitro baby might be considered the beginning of the genetic revolution. Since then, over five million so-called test tube babies have been born. Large-scale studies have shown that in vitro fertilization is safe and to a large degree, babies born from IVF are healthy and grow into healthy adults. If Louise Brown's parents were creating a baby today, they could check before the embryo was ever implanted in Leslie Brown's womb to be sure it was free of some genetic defects. Robin Maria McLaughlin used that technique to ensure their second child would be free of cystic fibrosis. I think the whole procedure is um, somewhat miraculous that, that we could go forward preventing children from coming into the world suffering this disease and, and possibly others. Cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, Huntington's, there are a number of inherited disorders which can doom their victims to short, difficult, miserable lives. Years ago, when amniocentesis became an accepted part of pregnancy, many decided that it was best to avoid giving birth to children with these diseases, even though terminating the pregnancy was the only other choice. It would be preferable to do uh, diagnosis and not create such a child. I think that is a moral good. It is an improvement to uh, not have to end a fetal life, but to, in fact, use the right gametes. I don't know of any religion that doesn't say that what parents should do is try to make life better for their kids. But that same technology might one day be used to eliminate embryos that have characteristics that are simply unwanted, not necessarily detrimental, say freckles, or parents might want to create embryos that embody their ambitions to be perhaps a great musician. If you believe in choice and you don't want to wind up with a government-imposed vision of genetic normalcy or genetic desirability, you've got to let people make their choices. And I would allow some limits if it turned out that uh, um, the choices that individuals are making about genetics were skewing uh, the safety or stability of a society. Dr. W. French Anderson, often called the father of gene therapy, worries where this new technology might take us in a world obsessed with beauty enhancement and makeovers. Gene therapy for cosmetic alteration would seem to have vast financial possibilities. We beautify ourselves all the time. We change our faces, our fingernails, our hair. We build our bodies up with weights and slim them down with exercise. There's an obsession with looks in our culture because, because the people who make the most money are the professional athletes. Who, who have the biggest, strongest bodies, and the models and actresses and so on who are the prettiest, even though it shouldn't be. 
looks do make a difference. It's one thing to take somebody who has a disease and bring them up into a, a normal, healthy. It's another thing to take a normal person and try to make them better than normal, whatever better means. Anderson says we don't know enough to be playing around with genes for what he calls trivial effects. It's like computer programs. When you go in and try to troubleshoot them and you begin mucking around inside them, you realize that it's hard to tweak one part of a program without causing a cascade of effects everywhere else. Uh, and I suspect genes will work that way too. I know they're going to work that way. Scientists say even if they figured out all the intricacies of multiple gene interactions, genes are not destiny. So I suspect we may not be able to simply whip up a model or a Adonis or something just by picking genes left and right. We might increase the chances of doing that, but not give us certainty. But if we do manage to modify the genes and control the environmental exposure, does that mean in a century everyone will look the same, beautiful and well-built? I think we have a certain idea in our heads. If we allow cosmetic genetic engineering, we're going to live in a world of Barbie and Ken's a couple of uh, generations from now. Leon Cass headed the Presidential Commission on Bioethics. To what extent should individuals be free to make their own decisions on these matters. We are acquiring a kind of sensibility which says we will accept nothing less than perfect. But um, it seems to me that prenatal and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is of a piece with what, we, what, what has become common practice, and I don't see that we're going to turn our back on that. Um, the atomic scientists had a genie out of the bottle at the end of World War II. The biologists are in the same place. Except in the case of the life sciences, we're not worrying about a genie in a bottle. We're worried about genes. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.